Hi, everyone, and welcome to Eli on Air, the weekly interactive broadcast from Eli Talks, in which we feature interesting conversations with folks from all across the Jewish spectrum on topics of Jewish engagement, literacy, and identity. My name is Miriam Berceau, and I'm the program director of Eli Talks, and I'm really thrilled to be sitting here today with producer and general theater resident renaissance man of Jewish theater and general theater, uh, Mr. David Chack. And we'll be chatting today about the 50th anniversary of the musical Fiddler on the Roof, this very iconic piece of, of musical theater, and um, a little bit about how that has shown and impacted Jewish identity across the years. Um, so Eli on Air is an interactive conversation. Please feel free to submit your questions right through the video or via Twitter using the hashtag EliTalks, and we'll take those live on the air. And um, meanwhile, we will jump right in. So thank you, David, for joining us today. Um, sure, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so let's just jump right in. And can you tell me a little bit about the history of Fiddler on the Roof, which did not actually start under that name, but had a completely different name and came from a story from Yiddish from from the Yiddish writers. Um, tell us a little bit about where it comes from. Right. Yeah. So um, most everybody knows that Shalom Alechem wrote the stories that created the Fiddler on the Roof as we know it today. They came from stories about a man named Tevya, the milkman. Tevya, who was, in a sense, the quintessential shlemiel in Jewish culture, a Jewish folk figure who always had something happening to him where he had bad luck, where he couldn't get the cow to milk, where he couldn't get his um, cart to go, where he couldn't... Um, get his daughters married off. I mean, all the different things that would happen to him. There would be all these different uh, events that he thought were going to go one way, and they wound up going another way. Like I said, this is a folk character that goes all the way back to at least the Middle Ages, if not longer. And the Shlemiel in Jewish history has a long, a long, long uh, line of, of stories and other things associated with it that I, I'm not going to go into today. But Tevya winds up being that kind of character for Shalom Aleichem. And I think when Shalom Aleichem was writing it, he found that in Tevya, he could, he could have a muse. He could have someone who would get into problems and get into uh, situations of bad luck, but then he could also ask questions that people were afraid to ask. He could ask questions about the identity of what it meant to be a Jew in the time of the Enlightenment, of what it meant to be a Jew in the time of persecution and pogroms in Russia, about what it meant to be a Jew in terms of immigration to other countries, uh, in terms of the emerging Zionism that was happening in the world. Uh, so Tevye winds up being this uh, every man or every Jew, and he embodies so much for Shalom Aleichem and for the readers who read these short stories uh, that Shalom Aleichem published both in Yiddish uh, newspapers and then in novels and, and, or in uh, novellas. And then uh, Shalom Aleichem wanted to go into theater and he sent out, as most playwrights know, these script treatments to uh, theater producers, who of course, like most theater producers, turn them down and uh, winds up like many Jewish playwrights wanting their plays to be produced and the producers think that the plays aren't good enough to be produced or what experience does he have in writing theater. I mean, all sorts of things that happen to every single playwright happen to Shalom Aleichem as well. And Shalom Aleichem came to the United States. A lot of people don't know that Shalom Aleichem is actually buried in Queens, New York. Mm. He uh, winds up dying in New York City uh, he has a huge, huge funeral. Uh, the numbers of people that came to it, I mean, have been likened to the numbers that came to Michael Jackson's funeral when he died. Uh, that's the kind of celebrity he was. And yet he still did not get the um, fame on, in theater and in Yiddish theater until after he died. Mm -hmm. And the character of Tevye winds up being that um, entree into fame for him uh, in this case, uh, posthumously. 
And Maurice Schwartz takes the character of Tevia and crafts it uh, based on plays that Shalom Aleichem wrote and also on his own, um, working with the play, and creates Tevia the Milchiker, Tevia the Dairy Man. And this winds up being a huge success in the Yiddish theater, and then he toured it all over the world. And that was the beginning of Tevya uh, really breaking forth uh, into the public and uh, being seen as this um, figure that could be every Jew. Just one more note on that, and then we'll perhaps get away from history a little bit, <laughs> is that Tevya winds up being this character that not only is seen in Shalom Aleichem plays, but then is extracted out of Shalom Aleichem plays and was even in a drama written by Ben Hecht, uh, the great newspaper reporter and then screenwriter and playwright. And he wrote a pageant with the great Yiddish theater actor Paul Muni playing Tevya. And actually Marlon Brando was in it as well. And the pageant was A Flag is Born. And it was about the emerging um, uh, people uh, coming out of the ashes of the Holocaust. It was written in the uh, mid-1940s and performed right after the Holocaust. And it was to raise money for Jews that were uh, left homeless from the Holocaust and raised, you know, a lot of money and was hugely attended. And Tevya was seen as this every Jew, like I said. And uh, Marlon Brando actually... Uh, got his start in theater. Uh, he had been in something before, of course, but uh, got his start in theater and was so influenced by the play, he even considered uh, converting to Judaism. Although Ben Heck said, you know, these people have uh, suffered enough. You don't want to take on their suffering. When, you know, Marlon Brando went on and, and took on a whole bunch of other suffering that uh, had nothing to do with the Jewish people. But, um, you know, this, this idea of Tevya as every Jew, even was exceeding Fiddler on the Roof um, even in the moment that, even before Fiddler was even created. And, uh, you know, the, the, the play, the musical play, when it finally got um, written, and, and a lot of the history, by the way, I want to give credit to Elisa Solomon and her wonderful book, Wonder of Wonders, which really captures mm -hmm. all of this history together. Uh, and I highly recommend the book. It's an amazing cultural history of Fiddler on the Roof. So anyway, um, the, the coming together for the musical was really one that, in a sense, was it was about time. You know, everybody was saying, you know, there needs to be a musical, there needs to be a musical play about Fiddler on the Roof. It had even been shopped out to Rodgers and Hammerstein, and they had put down, a, um, put down money to to think about producing it. They decided not to do it. So when uh, Bach and Harnick and Stein decided to do it, and then they got um, Jerome Robbins on board as the director, and um, Hal Prince as the uh, major producer, they created this team of people that not only wanted to do Fiddler on the Roof because of the stories and the Sholem Aleichem stories that they remembered from their childhood, but they wanted to do it because there was a way for them to explore something new in Jewish identity and Jewish culture in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And I think it was very much a part of what was going on in the 60s where Jewish ethnicity was not only becoming part of pop culture, but mm -hmm. it was becoming much more accepted to um, bring out Yiddish, Yiddishisms and Jewish humor and Jewish entertainment in ways that had never been seen before. Mm. So Fiddler was, in a sense, this accumulation of all of it. And when it opened in 1964, uh, actually the same year that Funny Girl opened, which also mm -hmm. has very strong Jewish themes in it, or at least strong Jewish underpinnings uh, through the character Fanny Bryce and Barbara Streisand, mm -hmm. um, those two shows really rocked Broadway. And of course Broadway was very Jewish in lots of ways, but not in such obvious Jewish ways. And this was the first time where Broadway was taking Jewish themes, Jewish culture, Jewish history, Jewish identity, and putting it front and center. It was really a groundbreaking, um, groundbreaking event. Mm. So 
so we're we're having this conversation because it's the 50th anniversary of the musical of Fiddler on the Roof, and as we've mentioned, the story goes back much further to to Shalom Aleichem and this whole generation of of Yiddish writers that uh, that were so influential. Um, but this this play, this story has been around for for ages, and it's so familiar to so many of us. Um, what do you think accounts for its endurance? Is it something about Tevya being this everyman and everyone being able to identify with some piece of him? Is it something about the kind of um, the, the family motif and um, being able to relate to the family, whoever you are, wherever you're from? Yeah, I mean, I think the family motif and the story of a... Of a kind of a bumpkin, a country, country bumpkin who can work his way out either through his own uh, abilities or just through luck, through chance, through mazel, uh, is able to, to make things come right, is an old story. I mean, that's not just a Jewish story. That's something that you can see uh, in Shakespeare. You can see it in folk tales. You can see it in Helm stories. I mean, these stories are just catch our imagination because we relate to them personally and we relate to the family situations in Fiddler on the Roof as well. But I think there's something more to it. I think that, um, number one, you can't take away from the genius of the creators. They really took the culture that, in many cases, they didn't know. I mean, Harnick and um, Bach were brought up in very assimilated environments. Uh, Stein was the only one, Joe Stein was the only one who came from an Orthodox Jewish family and was familiar with the rituals and the stories of uh, growing up Jewish. Um, Jerome Robbins, although he was brought up in a very Jewish household, rejected it and rejected his father to a great extent and had to really struggle with himself to come to terms with doing Fiddler on the Roof. And he went back to Poland and he visited uh, or tried to find the home that had been there and found that it had either um, disappeared, the town had disappeared, or that it had been, he was in the wrong geographic area. Uh, so he went on a personal journey himself in order to understand what it meant to be a Jew. So I think their strong connection to this desire for identity for themselves as Jews and for themselves as people, their artistic abilities, their genius in putting it all together, the mm. incredible, I mean, you're also getting Jerome Robbins at the peak of his career. He had just come off of West Side Story. Mm. He had also worked on Funny Girl. He was working with Leonard Bernstein on a, a, uh, a, a ballet based on the Dybbuk. I mean, he was really at his height. And so when he came into Fiddler on the Roof, his ideas and his imagination were just, you know, throbbing with wanting to make this into something special. He did not want it, and this in a way is the irony of how Fiddler on the Roof is often done today. He did not want it to be sentimental. He said, I have a quote here uh, from him, this musical must avoid making the Jews wry of expression and compassionate to the point of nausea. Mm. He really didn't want sentimentality to enter into this. He wanted it to be fresh. He wanted it to be new. He wanted it to feel as though it could happen today. He said, we are not to see them through the misty nostalgia of a time past, but through the everyday hard struggle to keep alive and to keep their beliefs. Hmm. And unfortunately, most productions <laughs> today are show Fiddler as, as this very sentimental, kitschy, yeah. uh, you know, uh, schmaltzy thing. And it's become something totally different than what he had wanted it to be. Hmm. That's so interesting. I, I, wow, I had no idea. Um, so I want to talk about this idea of Jewish identity and first of all how it's portrayed in Fiddler. 
and then also the impact that Fiddler has both on Jewish and non-Jewish audiences. And I was telling you before we jumped on the uh, the official hangout that, um, so I'm living in New York now and I had this experience on the subway in which I was sitting next to a grandmother and her grandchild who were, I didn't have any reason to think they were Jewish or not, but they um, saw a group of Hasidic men at the other end of the car and the grandmother pointed to them and turned to the little boy and said, remember when we saw Fiddler on the roof? And pointed and gestured over to this group of Hasidic men who were who were very sort of stereotypically Jewish looking. And on the one on the one hand, I was thinking like, wow, this is this family's maybe first encounter with Jews. And on the other hand, I was thinking, well, they're also sitting right next to one and have no idea <laughs> because I'm not in that garb. Um, and so I'm so thinking about this this idea of Fiddler being a uh, a nostalgic piece, I think, is really is really meaty. Um, can can you say just a little bit more about that about it, that identity piece and sort of how Fiddler portrays that and maybe the impact that it's had on both Jewish and non-Jewish audiences? Sure. I mean, this is what you're bringing up is really interesting. You know, because not only uh, were they looking at the Hasidim and saying, "Oh, remember when you saw Fiddler on the roof." And then you were watching this, you as an observant Jew were watching this and thinking, oh, they don't realize that I'm Jewish perhaps or that I'm an observant Jew. They're looking at these Hasidim who are wearing these costumes that really signify their Jewishness. It winds up being, I think, what happened for many Jews who came to this original play and also to Jews who see it today. They feel this insider-outsider connection to it. They're both inside because they can say, oh, we're Jewish, we have Jewish identity, we know what Shabbos is, we know what a challah is, we know about, you know, blessing our children, but we don't wear the Hasidic garb, we don't wear tzitzit, we don't wear, you know, payas, and we can also be part of the American society without people identifying us as Jews. So... Fiddler provides the ability for Jews to both be proud of who they are in whatever ways they want to signify their Jewishness, and then also to be chameleons, to fit into American society and not be identified. You know, for the most part, Fiddler is that kind of secular um, touchstone. It's interesting, as you know, you and I were talking uh, before as well about the, the flack that the newer production received when. Alfred Molina played it, and he's not Jewish, and he played Tevye. And the people that were upset with it, or who wrote about it, of course, were the reviewers, who in many cases were Jewish, and felt like they had a special connection to Fiddler. But for them, you know, what it meant to be Jewish was basically seeing Fiddler on the roof. I mean, most of them were probably secular Jews, and I'm making some assumptions here, but for the most part, my guess is they were not observant Jews, and they were upset because their symbols of being Jewish, you know, the, the Tevye that talks with this questioning voice and is always talking with a kind of Yiddishy accent and speaking to God and saying, oy vey, I mean, they were not seeing the things that made them feel good about being Jewish. And mm. they, you know, they, they kind of rejected and the, um, the Alfred Molina version, when Harvey Firestein took over, there was like this huge sigh of relief on Broadway. Oh, a Jew's finally playing Tevye. In this case, a gay Jew's playing Tevye. But that didn't matter. I and mean, that was, you know, that shows how not only society has moved forward, but also uh, Tevye can assume a kind of multivalence um, a symbol for people. And and in many and uh, Jerome Robbins was gay as well, and other people who wrote for uh, for the production and were in the production were gay, and you know you see this kind of multiculturalism that also Fiddler brings together. That's another point I wanted to make actually that I think brings us into modern times that Fiddler was a uh, a good precursor towards is that the story shows all these different kinds of Jews, but in many cases. They were different kinds of people. There was the 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 uh, suitor for one of the daughters who was a radical revolutionary, 
mm -hmm. there is the um, Russian, uh, um, the Russian Gentile who marries uh, one of Tevye's daughters. Um, so there's people in it that are coming from different cultures and different identities. And I think that was a precursor for what we're seeing today, which is the theater that, and a Jewish theater as well, that is bringing in multiple identities and cultures and ethnicities and gender differences that Jewish theater um, was really just starting to get to when Fiddler on the Roof uh, opened. Mm -hmm. So what... Um so now that we're up to modern times, and we actually had a comment come in uh, saying something like uh, the, the way that Jews are portrayed in Fiddler on the Roof is sort of feeds into this idea of that's what real Jews look like. And I think that's mm -hmm. true for, for Jews and non-Jews alike. Um, but can you say a little bit about what is the, what is the role of Fiddler today? I mean, we have this, um, this metaphor of being a Fiddler on the Roof, of being really optimistic and really precarious situations, is that still relevant? Is there another, has that metaphor taken different shape? What does, what, what can appeal to modern audiences about, about Fiddler? Well, I think you're right. Often the Fiddler character is seen as this optimistic character. I mean, it's like at the end of uh, Oliver, if I move to something that's slightly different but also has a Jewish uh, valence in it, and the character of Fagin. I mean, uh, Bart, Lionel Bart changed the ending of Oliver Twist and has Fagin get away, whereas in the original Charles Dickens version, I mean, Fagin is such a seamy, you know, uh, sniveling character of a Jew, and he's left there, you know, just crying in jail uh, and, and acting, you know, totally disgusting. And Lionel Bart, who was Jewish himself and was gay, uh, uses the Fagin character as a kind of crypto-Jew. And he escapes uh, Oliver, and he winds up, you know, in a sense, uh, with this plaintive melody that's almost like a fiddle. It's almost this fiddle klezmer sound. And he goes off, and he's free. And we see that in Fiddler on the Roof as well. When Tevye is being led by the Fiddler, the Fiddler becomes this optimistic feeling that tradition will continue and that no matter what the hard times are, no matter what the oppression is, you know, I'm still going to be there with you. Tradition will continue. And Shalom Aleichem, I think, was not so sure about that. And I think the newer versions of Fiddler on the Roof, at least the ones that are thoughtful and that really look into the history and stories uh, behind the Tevye stories, as well as reflecting today, are showing that you know, there's a little bit more of a sense of questioning. What is the future? What is the future for Jews? What is the future for humanity when oppression and evil and exile winds up being a constant story that we're trying to grapple with? We see this today in the headlines. We see, you know, exile and suffering going on with ethnic cleansing and all sorts of um, catastrophes that are going over, going on all over the world. And Fiddler on the Roof, I think, winds up changing, and, and the ending winds up changing. And it's hard to, you know, do the happy, clappy Jewish thing anymore. I think, you know, people do it because they want that. They want the romanticization, and they want the sentimentalization. They do it in high schools, and they do it for their, you know, Hadassah meetings. But I think, you know, thinking people, and I think even young people today are wanting something newer. They want something that's a little bit more relevant. And I do think Fiddler can provide that, but I think it's, you know, people have to really, you know, stretch to see that. Mm -hmm. So going back into the past for just a moment, we got a question that, that came in from Gina. Do you think the civil rights movement played into the heroic fighting Tevya of the 71 movie? He seems aware when others around him may not be. Well, I don't know if it played into the movie so much. I think the story of Tevya as Topol played him, and as Norman Jewison, who was not Jewish, by the way, even with a name like that, uh, as Norman Jewison depicted him, uh, he winds up being a very strong character. He winds up being, 
this character that's much less, uh, in a sense, feminized and, and Schlemiel-like mm -hmm. as Zero Mostel originally played him. And he may sometimes get into trouble because he's so strong, but he's not afraid to express his strength and his strong ideas and his strong opinions. And I think people were looking to that. But it's interesting that this person brings up civil rights. There was a, um, back in 1968, there was a version of Fiddler on the Roof, which also Lisa Solomon uh, portrays in, in her book. And, and there was a TV special about it, about a Fiddler on the Roof that was done right in the middle of uh, the desire for integration in Brownsville, uh, Brooklyn, where most of the people playing or the students playing uh, in Fiddler were black or Latino and mm -hmm. it was a huge outcry against it. Jews were against it and even African Americans were against it and there was a special on television that tried to show what they were doing was trying to bring the communities together in Brownsville in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and the uh, the musical play eventually did get performed with the blessing of the creators of it, Sheldon Harnick, gave it his stamp of approval and actually was there at opening night. And I think uh, Jerry Bach and Joe Stein were also there. And the play kind of depicted for, for the people in it the struggle for economic rights. And mm. this is something that's underneath the musical play and is definitely part of the Shalom Aleichem stories and um, that was used a lot in the 1950s for the struggle for for freedom for workers and for uh, the labor movement uh, especially during the time of McCarthy there was a significant um, not a musical version but a dramatic play version of it in the 1950s and almost every single person who was in it had been blacklisted from entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, Howard De Silva and Arnold Pearl produced it. Howard De Silva was in it. Zero Mostel was in it. Jack Guilford was in it. Um, Lee Grant, who just published her memoirs, was in the television production of it. And they were all blacklisted in the 50s. And so that version of the world, it was called The World of Sholem Aleichem, and featured Tefia and other Yiddish um, literary stories. Mm -hmm. uh, was a way to show uh, social justice movements in this country and civil rights certainly uh, was part of that as well. Mm. Um, really interesting. So um, with our last five or so minutes I would love to talk a little bit about kind of the future of Jewish theater or maybe the the present of Jewish theater um, because as we were as we were chatting beforehand, it seems uh, that when when folks think of Jewish theater, it tends to be Fiddler on the Roof, tends to be Anne Frank, and maybe a handful of other productions that have been put on that have these Jewish themes. Um, but but clearly, there's a lot more going on in this world, and a uh, and and other things that are that are worth thinking about. So, um, can you just say a little bit about where you see Jewish theater going, and um, and kind of the way that people are addressing Jewish identity through this particular art form? Well, what's really interesting now, it's, a, it's a, in a sense a new phenomenon. I don't know how widespread it will be, but people who aren't Jewish are using Jewish stories to create plays about Jews. Now, whether you want to call it Jewish theater or not might be you know, up for debate. I would call it Jewish theater. So you have Matthew Lopez doing The Whipping Man, about Jews during the Civil War, Jews and blacks during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Matthew Lopez is not Jewish and he wrote a wonderful play about the intersection of uh, slavery at the, at the end of the Civil War and, and the freeing of the slaves during the time of a Passover Seder. Now this is a, a great you know, overlay and really in, gets to the previous person's uh, question or at least um, you know, thought about civil rights and how Judaism can uh, both uh, look at that from a Jewish perspective and also take itself to task because Jews were slave owners as well. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that uh, is happening is that things like, or plays like Fiddler on the Roof are influencing plays in musical theater that aren't necessarily Jewish or at least uh, not 
literally Jewish, uh, in the Heights by Lynn uh, Manuel Miranda, he says was based on in structure and format on Fiddler on the Roof, mm -hmm. and it's about uh, Latinos in Washington Heights and about the uh, barrio there. But reviewers have remarked on this, and uh, Lynn Manuel uh, says it quite directly that. Fiddler on the Roof was a strong influence on him in writing this musical play. He's also said in other interviews that Chaim Potok was one of his greatest influences when he was in high school, and he even received an honorary doctorate from Yeshiva University for the work that he's done on uh, in the Heights. So um, Jewish theater is now, I think, coming in many forms. There are Jewish plays that are written um, by Jews. I just recently did a play by Rosalind Alexander about the passions of Emma Goldman that uh, is a one-woman show about this radical revolutionary uh, who has really something to say today because of women's rights and workers' rights and how people are not realizing that these rights not only are eroding but they're literally being taken away from them. The social justice rights that uh, many people, Jews included, fought for in the early 1900s, all of this is eroding, um, and you know there's other Jewish theater as well that is really exciting, and uh, that we see all the time through the Association for Jewish Theater, which I'm president of, and also through Spiel Performing Identity, the theater uh, group that I and project that I help to lead in Chicago. I mean, we're working to develop works out of identity, heritage, and culture that come from multiple sources, both within Jewish culture and outside of Jewish culture, with African Americans, with gay, lesbian, and um, transgender, with uh, Latino, with Asian Americans. And uh, no, Jewish theater is not just Anne Frank and Fiddler mm -hmm. on the Roof. And yet those plays kind of paved the way for where we are today. And um, there's more to come. I don't. I think Jewish theater is alive and well, and living on stage in almost every community. A lot of people don't realize that they're seeing Jewish theater either. You know, it's ubiquitous. It's mm -hmm. part of the culture. It's become so much a part of American culture that Americans don't even know that. You know, they're eating bagels, and that comes from mm -hmm. Jewish culture. So, uh, performance is just um, you know so influenced by Jewish culture and we need to be proud of that and we also need to see that it's a way for us to continue to explore our Jewish identity. I mean if you're gonna ask me uh, what I think the major message is in Fiddler on the Roof, I would say it's the Jewish journey for identity and that's what Tevya is searching for, that's what the creators were searching for, that's what I think all of us are searching for every time we go and see it. We're searching for the deep roots of our own personal identity and how it connects to what we see on stage. And that, of course, is the beauty of theater, to make it spring alive and bring us to a sense of transcendence and a sense of joy within ourselves. Beautiful words to end on. Um, I want to thank everybody who, who joined us today. Um, and submitted their questions and, and watched along with us. Thank you so much, David, for sharing your time and talent and wisdom. I think this is a really interesting conversation, not only about Fiddler on the Roof and so much of this rich history and intricacies and, and personalities and all of these things involved with it, but uh, about Jewish identity and Jewish theater and the future of all of this. I, I hope that all of our viewers continue to explore these things. Check out Spiel. Check out the Association for Jewish Theater and go see a play sometime soon. Um, yeah, really. So with that, um, we hope to see you next week on Eli on Air. We'll be talking with Sarah Blattner and Sam Abramovich about digital badges and Jewish education and professional development. And it'll be a really exciting conversation and um, about the future of Jewish education. Um, so with that, I'm Miriam Berceau. Thank you again to David Chek. And Great. we'll see you Thank all next you. week on air. Thanks, everyone.